Um, okay, well, thank you all for sticking it out. I know I'm the second to last talk, which A means it's one step closer to happy hour, so that's a positive. Um, historically, when I've given this talk, I have tried to give like snippets of all of the oncology drugs that were approved for the year, which is not very efficient and is not a great way to learn. And actually, someone mentioned to me just earlier today, pharmacy updates is usually when people kind of zone out. And she's like, she knows me personally. It was nothing, you know, that she was being rude. But I was like, you're right, it totally is. Um, so I chose today to just go through four big drugs that were approved within the last year and kind of look at them more in depth, the studies that got them approved. It sounds like Dr. Lewis already talked about a couple. Dr. Bunn talked about one. So this will hopefully be a kind of a good summary of things you guys have already heard. So for learning objectives, I do hope you can at least recognize new drugs that were approved within the last year. I do have a full list that I made for you for your reference um, and be able to interpret and discuss the landmark studies that we're gonna go through. I obviously am biased. I work in the melanoma clinic, so two of them are melanoma drugs. Um, and then one lung drug and then one for breast. Um, and then understand how this could potentially be practice changing because the studies that we're gonna go through are really, I think, kind of a big deal in cancer right now. Um, I did find a study that I found very interesting. This kind of looked at the number of drugs that have been approved in the last year, and they said, oh, well, even based on COVID and the fact that FDA isn't really working as efficiently as they normally are, basically the same number of new drugs were approved in the last year as has been historically. Um, so 50 new drugs in 2021, the five-year average has been 51 drugs, which is pretty similar. Um, and as you guys can probably imagine, oncology accounts for the largest percent of new drugs that are approved. Um, this I just found interesting, which kind of just shows the number of drugs, the number of new drugs that have been approved kind of over the years. You can see it is trending upward, but within the last five years or so, things have been pretty stable. And then this is the um, therapeutic areas. So you can see oncology is like off the charts, right? We um, approve and study more drugs than any other therapeutic area, and it is impossible to keep up with everything, which is why I'm just going through four today. Um, this is really for your reference. So this I just put together really for you guys to kind of have moving forward. It just goes through all of the drugs, the new oncology drugs that were approved in the last year, um, the name, who makes it, the mechanism, and kind of the indication. So this will just be for you guys. Uh, same, we already have a pretty significant number of drugs that have been approved thus far in 2022. Um, so that's just a continuation of that. As I said, I'm really gonna be going through four practice changing studies that I feel are really things that you guys, it will be helpful to know regardless of what area you work in. These are drugs that you're definitely gonna be hearing about uh, moving forward. The first one is a combination of nivolumab and relatlamab um, for unresectable or metastatic melanoma. The second is tabentafusp, which is very hard to say. Um, the brand name is Kimtrak, which is easier to say. This is for metastatic uveal melanoma. Um, we are gonna go through the neoadjuvant study that Dr. Bunn mentioned, so Nevo plus chemo um, uh, for early stage non-small cell lung cancer, and then fam trastuzumab durux tcan which is also a mouthful, um, which has now been moved up in where you use that in breast cancer. So the first study that we're gonna go through is the combination of Rella and Nevo, which is what most people refer to it as. Um, this was published in January of this year. I'm sure you guys have gotten like a million immunotherapy slides up to this point. Um, this is probably my favorite slide because it's so easy to look at and understand. So for anyone who's not super familiar, T cells have all of these immune checkpoints, right? We call them the gas and the brakes of the immune system. And this makes it really easy to look at. So anything that's activating, which is on the left-hand side, um, when the ligand is bound to the receptor there, it essentially activates that T cell, right? It's an activating receptor. On the flip side, you have inhibitory receptors, um, and they do the exact opposite. So when the ligand is bound to the receptor there, it essentially shuts that T cell off or inhibits it. Um, and so you can see on the right-hand side, we do have drugs now approved for multiple immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, that's CTLA-4, PD-1, and just recently, which is what we'll be going over, is LAG-3, which is the one down the bottom. Um, so the combination of Nevo and Rella is called Obdualag. I know my BMS rep is here, and he knows how I feel about this name. Um, Obdualag, Obdual plus lag is where it came from. So creative. <laughs> 
Um, so this is a combination of nivolumab plus relatlimab combined into one drug that's given in one bag, which is really nice and easy. Um, nivolumab, as you guys are very well aware, is a PD-1 inhibitor. So on the right side of the schematic, you have PD-1 receptor, which is expressed on T cells. You have tumor cells, which overexpress PD ligand. When that's bound, shuts the T cell off. Um, on the other side, you have LAG3, which is the other inhibitory receptor that we just talked about. That's relatlimab. This is a first-in-class LAG3 inhibitor. Um, and so basically, same concept. Binds to um, the LAG ligand that's on the um, tumor cell, shuts that T cell off. So these are distinct inhibitory immune checkpoints. However, they are often co-expressed on T cells. So when those are bound together, you can imagine that that is what leads to kind of T cell exha exhaustion and uh, shutting those T cells off. So the combination of the two was studied in a landmark uh, trial called Relativity 047. Um, this is a phase two, three global double-blind randomized trial, which you can see here. Um, this was in treatment naive, unresectable or metastatic melanoma patients. Um, they were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either the combination of Nevo and Rella or Nevo alone. Um, I will highlight the dosing. So the dosing is a flat dose. It's very easy. So it's the standard Nevo dose that we would use for four-week dosing plus a flat dose of relatlimab. Um, and that's actually given in the same bag. It's given, you know, when you get it at the pharmacy, it's in the same vial. So it's all very easy. Um, and so the primary endpoint there was progression-free survival. So um, in terms of outcomes, so the median progression-free survival was almost double with Nevo Rella compared to Nevo alone. Well, it was more than double. It was 10.1 months compared to 4.6 months. I know you guys have probably seen like a million Kaplan-Meier curves, but really what you're looking for in the middle there is that separation, which you can see very distinctly. Um, and the median progression-free survival, you look at where that 50% is on the left-hand side and kind of just move across and see where it falls on there. This was statistically significant, as you can see with the p-value there. Um, and this was really seen across subgroups. So the benefit with the combination of Nevo and Rella was seen regardless of LAG3 expression. Um, I feel like this is going to come up time and time again, because still in melanoma, we get asked all the time about PD-L1 expression. And you know, in melanoma, we know that patients can respond to PD-1 inhibitors even if they have a low PD-L1 expression. Um, so the benefit here, again, was seen regardless of LAG3 expression. Um, I thought this was interesting. The median progression-free survival was similar for patients that had a PD-L1 expression of 1% or greater. So it was 15.7 months with the combo compared to 14.7 months with Nevo alone. Um, but if they had a low PD-L1 expression, you could see the median PFS was 6.4 months compared to 2.9 months. Um, this benefit was seen regardless of BRAF status and also regardless of stage, LDH, and tumor burden. Um, I added all of these in because I think it's a very quick and easy way to just kind of look at different subgroups. So as you can tell, the left-hand side is the nevo Rella group. The right-hand side is the Nivolumab group. So really across subgroups, pretty much all of them favored the combination of Rella and Nevo. Um, in terms of safety, so the grade three, four side effects, those more serious side effects that we talk about, um, was 18.9% with the combination compared to 9.7% uh, with Nevo. When you think about our options in metastatic melanoma leading up to this point, it was PD-1 or combination CTLA-4 and PD-1. So for combination CTLA-4 and PD-1, the rate of grade three, four side effects is about 50%. So in terms of toxicity, this is significantly less toxic than something like ipinevo, um, but definitely still more toxic than single-agent PD-1. Um, you can see the discontinuation rates there. There were three deaths in the nevo Rella group and two in the um, nevo alone group. And then the most common immune-related side effects, you can see um, hypothyroidism, rash, diarrhea. Um, I did highlight this just because we did have this drug on study in our clinic, um, and I found it interesting. They required routine troponin monitoring for a theoretical increased risk for myocarditis. Um, that was for the first two months. Um, however, there's no real standard like monitoring that's recommended in the package insert, so I just listed the percentages there for you guys. Um, so now this is listed in NCCN as um, first line for metastatic or unresectable melanoma alongside with PD-1 um, or CTLA-4 PD-1 combination. Um, 
Next drug that we're going to be talking about is tibentafusp. Um, this is for metastatic uveal melanoma. This was published September of last year. Um, uveal melanoma um, is actually very interesting. A lot of people, when they think of melanoma, don't think that you can actually get melanoma of the eye. Um, but you do have melanocytes within the uveal tract of the eye. Uh, this most commonly occurs within the choroid. That's 85 to 90 percent of cases, um, but can also occur in the ciliary body and less commonly in the iris. Despite the fact that this is a very rare type of cancer, it's actually the most common primary intraocular malignancy in adults. Um, and probably the most important thing to know is that it's completely different from cutaneous melanoma. And, you know, the risk factors, the genetics, um, where it spreads, all of that. Um, probably the most important thing to know is things like BRAF and NRAS and these things we talk about for cutaneous melanoma are just very, very rare in uveal melanoma. So we don't have those targets that we have um, in cutaneous melanoma. And then the other important thing to know is that uveal melanoma has a very low mutational burden. So things like checkpoint inhibitors that we use and work really well in cutaneous melanoma just don't work in uveal melanoma. So unfortunately, up until this drug was approved, we really had nothing that actually was any good or actually provided any sort of survival benefit. Um, and despite aggressive therapy of the primary lesion, so most uveal melanomas are diagnosed on like routine eye exams. Um, so even though the primary lesion is treated pretty aggressively, almost 50% of cases end up relapsing and becoming metastatic. Uh, the most common place for this to spread is to the liver. I did put a schematic of an eye in here because until this drug was approved, I didn't really know anything about the eye. So I assume that most people don't know where the choroid is. Um, it's this middle section that you can see at the top there. Uh, the choroid is the most common. Um, and then on the bottom left, you can see ciliary body is next. And then it can also occur within the iris. Is this my water? There's two waters up here. <laughs> I hope this is mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Tibentafusp, which uh, the brand name is Kimtrak, is a bispecific T-cell engager. So this is very similar to blinatumumab, if you're familiar with that drug. Um, so the schematic that you see here, you can see Tibentafusp is in the middle, binding GP100, which is um, expressed on uveal melanoma cells, and then also binding to T-cells. So essentially works as a bridge between T-cells and uveal melanoma cells kind of allowing them to release those cytokines and cause them to go in and kill those uveal melanoma cells. Um, GP100, that peptide, is present on a specific uh, HLA subtype. That's HLA-A0201. Um, and so this drug will only work if your patient has this HLA subtype. So I bolded it. Don't ever give Kimtrak or Tibentafusp to someone before you do HLA typing. You 100% have to do it before you give this drug. Um, and about 50% of all uveal melanoma cases will have this HLA type. Um, so Tibentafusp, this is the kind of landmark trial that um, put it on the map. It's IMCGP100202. This is the largest phase three trial that's ever been done in metastatic uveal melanoma, so 378 patients. Um, it was an open label phase three trial, which you can see here. They had to have that HLA subtype like I mentioned. Um, these were previously untreated, untreated patients in the advanced setting, any LDH, um, and had to have measurable disease. Um, and so you can see they were randomized two to one to either Tibentafusp or investigator's choice, which could be either pembrolizumab, ipilimumab, or decarbazine. Um, I will just highlight the dose of Tibentafusp that you can see here. So it's given weekly, which is a lot for patients. It's given once a week. Um, and they have to go through basically a titration initially. So the first dose is 20 micrograms, the second dose is 30 micrograms, and then the third and subsequent doses is 68 micrograms. Um, and we'll go into kind of more of the monitoring and how that's given in a, in a minute. And the primary endpoint here was overall survival. Um, so again, just basically looking at Kaplan-Meier curves, really looking for that separation of the two curves. You can see the blue on top is Tibentafusp, uh, and then the gray line down the bottom is the investigator's choice. So you can see here the significantly improved overall survival, which again, up to this point, not a single drug had ever been proven to do in uveal melanoma. Um, so median overall survival in TEBI group was 21.7 months compared to 16 months with investigator's choice. 
Um, and this again was seen across uh, all subgroups. So in terms of safety, so this drug does have a black box warning for cytokine release syndrome. Anyone who has given a drug like blinatumumab, it's very, very similar. Um, so CRS, or cytokine release syndrome, typically presents with fever, shortness of breath, hypoxia, hypotension, um, elevations and transaminases. Um, they are generally reversible and managed with things like fluids and steroids and supportive care. However, they can, this can progress um, in severity very quickly. So patients require very close monitoring when they're receiving this. Um, fluid status, their vitals, O2 sats, um, and symptoms typically present quickly, usually within the first eight hours. So because of this, for the first three doses, patients have to be monitored for 16 hours. Um, so that's kind of in that initial titration period that we were talking about before. At our facility, we don't have a, an area to monitor people for 16 hours. Our infusion center isn't open that long, so we actually admit them into the hospital and kind of monitor them inpatient. Um, the overall risk of CRS, or the overall percentage of patients, was 89. However, you can tell here that a very, very small percentage of those are actually severe enough where patients require vasopressors or something more serious. Um, that was 0.8% of patients. Um, and ultimately, only 1.2% of patients had to discontinue treatment due to CRS. Um, I put the most common side effects here. I feel like these are really related to kind of the cytokine release that we were mentioning. So things like pyrexia, puritis, fatigue, um, hypotension, all those sorts of things. Um, like I said, these are really generally predictable and manageable as long as they're caught early and, and, and managed appropriately. So that's why these patients have to be monitored very, very closely. Um, and then the other really common thing that happens is rash. So 83% of patients get a rash. You can actually see here that this is a pretty high rate of grade three, four rash. So 18% of patients are gonna get a pretty nasty rash. Um, it does occur very early, usually again within the first few hours. Um, and then it actually decreases in severity just like the risk of CRS. So as the you know, treatment goes on after those first three high risk doses, the risk of these things happening goes down pretty dramatically. Um, and interestingly, they actually went back and looked and saw that patients who did develop a rash actually had improved overall survival. So the overall survival in those that got a rash was 27 months. That was compared to those that didn't get a rash, uh, which was 18 months. Um, and in general, when you think about discontinuation rates of any cancer treatment, the overall discontinuation rate was uh, only 3.3%, which is actually very low. I mean, the investigator's choice, um, on the other hand, was 6.3%. Um, this is also now listed in NCCN, um, which is great. I mean, the only other thing before this was like clinical trial as the preferred recommended treatment. Um, the other regimens that are listed in there, like I said, are things that we've historically tried but haven't really been great for uveal melanoma. Um, so next study, we're talking about the Checkmate 816 study, which Dr. Bunn uh, went over a little bit earlier. Um, this is neoadjuvant nevo plus chemo in resectable lung cancer. Um, so as you guys are all well aware, lung cancer is an incredibly difficult uh, disease to treat. And although 20 to 25% of patients are technically considered resectable at diagnosis, we know that a large percentage of them are going to go on to recur and ultimately die of lung cancer. Um, and I feel like in many different disease states now, we're kind of moving up when we use immunotherapy, right? First it was second line, then it was adjuvant, and now it's neoadjuvant. Um, and really the idea here is that you're really allowing for primed anti-tumor immunity. So you have that you know, bulk tumor in there, you have all those tumor antigens that the immunotherapy is able to use um, in the presence of that primary tumor. And so we know that NEVO-based regimens have provided an overall survival benefit in metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. So Checkmate 816, um, this was a randomized open-label phase three trial. Again, this is early stage lung cancer, so stage 1B through 3A, uh, resectable non-small cell lung cancer. Patients were um, enrolled regardless of PD-L1 expression, and as Dr. Bunn had mentioned, if they had the presence of an ALK or EGFR mutation, they were excluded. Um, you can see here they were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either NEVO plus chemo, which he mentioned before was um, the platinum doublet, 
Uh, that's for three cycles or just chemo alone for three cycles. And then they basically underwent surgery um, within six weeks of the um, treatment. And then all patients had the option of undergoing four cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy with or without radiation. And primary endpoints were event-free survival and pathologic complete response. Um, so the first primary endpoint, which was event-free survival, you can see here was 31.6 months with Nevo chemo compared to 20.8 months with chemo alone. So again, you see a pretty early separation. That separation is pretty distinct as you move through time. Um, this favored Nevo chemo across most subgroups. Um, I did list here that the magnitude of benefit was actually greater in specific subgroups, so those with 3A disease versus earlier, those with a PDL1 expression of 1% or greater, and those with non squamous histology. Um, I put this in here again, really, so you guys could just see it visually, but you know, on the left hand side, Nevo plus chemo really favored pretty much across um, all subgroups. Uh, this, which I think Dr. Bunn did present, I think is like astonishing. This is talking about path CR rates. So essentially they go in, they resect the tumor, they look at it under the microscope, and there's virtually no evidence of cancer um, as a pathologic complete response. So the rate of that was 24% with Nevo plus chemo compared to 2.2% with chemo alone. Um, so you can see that is a, a drastic difference. Um, the p-value there is obviously um, statistically significant, and this was seen across all subgroups as well, regardless of stage, PDL1 expression, their histologic subtype, it didn't matter, um, which you can see here. So on the right-hand side is the Nevo chemo group. On the left-hand side is chemotherapy alone, so you can see pretty much every subgroup. Um, this is for path CR favored Nevo plus chemo. And then in terms of safety, I also found this very interesting. So most common adverse reactions are pretty much what you would expect, nausea, fatigue, constipation, rash. Um, in terms of grade three, four side effects, they were actually a little bit lower in the Nevo chemo group compared to chemo. Um, adding Nevo did not cause any increase in delays or cancellations of surgery. Um, and the length of hospital stay following surgery and surgical complications was essentially you know, very similar. On top of that, the addition of chemo, as you, uh, Nevo to chemo, as you can imagine, shortened the duration of their surgery, shortened um, or caused them to use more minimally invasive approaches, less pneumonectomies, so overall patients doing better, having less invasive surgeries. Um, this is now listed in NCCN guidelines, um, so you can see I put the box around it. For neoadjuvant systemic therapy, it's Nevo plus um, the platinum doublet chemotherapy. And the last one that we're going through is trastuzumab durux tcan. Um, this was compared to trastuzumab mtansine, which I will refer to as TDM1 because that's much easier to say. Um, and this was just published in March of this year. Um, so again, just a little bit of background. So about 20% of breast cancers overexpress HER2. Um, and HER2-targeted therapies have improved outcomes, but not necessarily have become curative in patients with metastatic disease. So standard frontline therapy for HER2 metastatic disease up to this point is pertuzumab or trastuzumab plus a taxane. Um, second line treatment has been up to this point trastuzumab emtansine, which is the TDM1. Um, and prior to this, trastuzumab durex TCAN was FDA approved back in 2019. Um, for unresectable or metastatic HER2 breast cancer, but in the third line setting. So they had to have at least two or more prior lines of HER2 therapy before they would be eligible to receive trastuzumab durex TCAN. Um, so this is a, kind of a schematic of the drug itself. I feel like this is a very like nerdy pharmacy slide, so you don't have to read all the words on it. <laughs> Um, it really just talks about you know, what it is, which is an antibody drug conjugate. Everyone knows it's very similar in that sense to um, TDM1. However, it's bound here to a topor isomerase inhibitor. Um, so you know, it essentially looks the same as trastuzumab, but essentially allows targeted delivery of that topor isomerase inhibitor, which is what the left-hand side talks about. The only cool thing that I will say, which is different about this drug compared to TDM1, is it has this uh, bystander anti-tumor effect, and so it doesn't just kill the, the tumor cell that it's attacking or targeting, it can actually kill surrounding tumor cells that overexpress HER2 as well. 
and that's called the bystander effect. Um, so this drug was originally studied in the phase two study was Destiny 1. This new phase three study is Destiny 3. This is where um, it was a multi-center open label uh, randomized trial um, that enrolled 524 patients. Again, these were HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer patients that had previously received trastuzumab plus ataxane. Um, so you can see here they um, received prior trastuzumab. The most important thing that I think I will highlight of the inclusion criteria is they allowed patients that had clinically stable treated brain mets to enroll. Um, so patients that had brain metastases were enrolled, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, stratification factors you can see there, and they were randomized one-to-one to, -one to trastuzumab, durex tcan um, which is in HER2, or TDM1, um, which is Cadsila, that's the brand name. Those are both given every three weeks, um, and the primary endpoint was progression-free survival. So we've looked at a lot of graphs. There's been separation for pretty much all of them. That's pretty good. This is like out of the park. These are not even near each other. They're very, very, very separated, right? So you look at this and you're like, wow, these are not even close to each other. So in the realm of you know, Kaplan-Meier curves, you can look at this and instantly say, wow, there's a huge difference here, right? So the median progression-free survival was not even reached for trastuzumab durex tcan um, compared to 6.8 months for TDM1. Um, the hazard ratio here, which if you're not super into statistics, I wrote, means a 72% reduction in the risk of progression um, with DREX TCAN versus TDM1. This benefit was seen across all subgroups, and the overall response rate was 79.7% compared to 34.2%. Um, so really, really, really crazy. And then you know, before when we were looking at the subgroup analyses, you can see a lot of them have, you know, lines that cross and don't necessarily look like this. Like every single subgroup here is drastically to the left, which favors trastuzumab durex tcan. Again, this is regardless of their hormone receptor status, if they had visceral disease or not. The other thing that I think is super important to highlight is this is also including patients that had stable brain metastases. Um, so you can see this drastically favors trastuzumab durex tcan. Um, in terms of safety, so if it sounds really too good to be true, it may or may not be. It's still a much better drug. However, it does have a couple uh, nuances. And one is the interstitial lung disease. Um, so it does have a black box warning for that. And so as nurses, you guys are 100% gonna have to be monitoring and um, educating patients on signs and symptoms of any new respiratory symptoms. Um, cough, shortness of breath, whatever it is. These patients have to be monitored very closely um, and really any signs or symptoms of interstitial lung disease have to be investigated immediately. Um, the any grade ILD that was reported here is 10.5%. That's actually lower than what was reported in the original Destiny 1 study. Um, and the median time to onset is pretty delayed. It's 5.5 months. However, you can see the range there is very wide. Um, and really the recommendation is to permanently discontinue treatment for anyone that has a grade two or higher interstitial lung disease or pneumonitis. Um, and the other black box warning is for embryo fetal toxicity. Um, I just made this uh, because I think it's kind of easier to look at the um, box that I put down the bottom. The most common drug-related adverse events you can see here. So nausea, fatigue, vomiting, and alopecia. Um, occurred much more commonly with trastuzumab durex tcan than they did with TDM1. Um, I will specifically highlight nausea. That was 72.8% compared to 27.6%. Um, and the next section talks about the grade three, four side effects. So those more serious side effects, um, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, leukopenia, and nausea, which I have listed. Um, neutropenia, occurred much more frequently. The only one that is different, um, thrombocytopenia was much more common in the TDM1 group. Um, I did highlight here that all these patients must have an an a good anti-emetic regimen, um, obviously based on the percentage of nausea there. This is considered moderately emetogenic, um, so they do all need to have good anti-emetic regimens. 
um, and there were no drug-related deaths in either arm. So I just put all grade, grade three or four, and then the percentage that needed discontinuation versus dose interruption and dose reduction listed there. Um, so this has now moved its way up in the NCCN guidelines. So previously, like I said, this was really only recommended third line and beyond. So this has now moved up into the preferred regimen um, for second line patients that have HER2 positive disease. Um, again, this is following taxane plus a HER2 treatment prior to that. This is a category one recommendation. Um, so in summary, I, at least, you know, I work with Dr. Lewis, so he'll tell you all day about it. I think Rela Nevo is really going to replace many of our single agent PD1 patients that we have um, for metastatic melanoma, really based on the fact that it's more efficacious than um, single agent PD1 and also still less toxic than what we are used to for combination immunotherapy with um, CTLA4. Um, Tibentafusp is the first and only drug that's ever shown a survival benefit in uveal melanoma, so this is very, very exciting for our patients. Um, neoadjuvant Nevo plus chemo, as Dr. Bunn alluded to, is really going to become the standard for early stage um, non-small cell lung cancer um, for patients that don't have those uh, ALK or EGFR mutations. Um, and if you asked our breast providers, they would probably say that trastuzumab directs TCAN is really going to replace TDM1 in that second line setting um, based on the results of the DESTINY3 trial. And May is Skin Cancer Awareness Month, so everyone get your skin checked, and I will gladly take any questions.